PayPal manages a lot of data. And for all of you who have this challenge in your companies, we are talking about a lot of data. 425 million active accounts, processing an average of 58 million transactions a day. You have to use AI. How do you use AI to make customers feel like they are people and not a number? Right, yep. Yeah, um, with this many transactions, is we have a lot of variety of customers. So we want to know every single customer what their preferences are. And uh, the main way to learn is uh, through AI. Like uh, AI has been really helping us to learn all these different uh, behavior patterns, like uh, behavior patterns, like also all the preferences like uh, from deep learning, latest uh, technologies, deep learning. So uh, we have applied uh, many different models on learning uh, through the product, how they interact with our products. And also customer service, we apply a lot of AI as well to uh, make the experience a lot more streamlined on how we can know the intent when they come to us, what they're looking for, and also like uh, when they interact with our product, like what are the pain points, we can learn through uh, AI a lot. Okay, I'm gonna ask you about some of those pain points in a moment, but Avery, we're gonna turn to you and your challenges. You process transactions, but a big challenge is providing the things that the people are actually looking for. You said, you told me you had 23,000 unique products, and that doesn't include the variety of sizing that goes into the clothing. So how do you use AI to manage all of that? Yeah, and ironically, that's one of our four brands. So if you think about the total breadth of what we do, it's actually many more than that. You know, when we think about AI and the applications and when we're trying to figure out what we want to use it for, one of the things that we look for is opportunities where there's millions of little decisions to make, micro decisions. And so as we think about the customer and the customer experience, one of the things that may not be obvious is, you know, the inventory that we show the customer, how we present ourselves to the customer is really important to that experience. When we look at our NPS scores, one of the largest negative drivers of NPS is I can't find what I'm looking for. That could be for a variety of reasons. We literally don't carry umbrellas and maybe they're looking for one or something that we do carry that we don't have. And a lot of that is controllable. And as we think about the analytics behind those micro decisions, whether it's the forecasting that drives our understanding of what inventory needs to be in which store, whether it is identifying operational issues in our 2,000 stores across those 20, you know, some thousand items. These are things that individual humans really can't do at scale. And those are the perfect applications for us for AI. And that's really where we see the benefit of it as it relates to how we present our inventory to the customer, which again, is maybe not how you think about customer experience, but honestly, it's one of the largest drivers of your satisfaction as you come into one of our stores. If only it were so simple as just putting a big sign, we do not have umbrellas. I uh, probably would have less of a job, <laughs> but yes. Raj, I want you to remind us all the umbrella brands under Williams-Sonoma because we think of all of our kitchenware, but actually it's a lot of companies. So please remind us the different brands under that one name. Yep, uh, Williams-Sonoma Incorporated is actually most uh, made up of almost seven brands and various combinations. Some of, most of them you might know about, but if, if you didn't know they were all part of an umbrella, let me introduce. So it's Williams-Sonoma, which is our kitchen-focused brand and we have uh, Pottery Barn, which uh, is focused more on furniture. And uh, over time, Pottery Barn created sub-brands for kids, specifically focused on kids' furniture, and then teen. Um, and then we have West Elm, which is also a furniture brand, but looking at more of a modern style. Pottery Barn is a little bit more traditional, uh, so that, that, was, that was the rationale behind the brands. Then we have uh, a brand that focuses purely on lighting, rejuvenation. And then we have a brand that focuses on customization and monogramming, which is Mark and Graham. And uh, William Sonoma has a, a home sub-brand, which yeah. focuses just on uh, home furnishings. So something that I learned is that all of these different brands under William Sonoma leads to a million different products for this company. So let's go with the most well-known brand of the company. How, do you, how does automation help that customer find that Japanese steel paring knife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good one. Uh, it's one of our popular products, as, <laughs> as you might know, it's a Shun brand is in yes. William Sonoma, but um, I think that that's the only way for us to be able to handle so many uh, diverse products across so many categories. Even though this is within the home space, um, we are talking about kitchen is on one side, furniture is on one side, lighting is on other. So these are really diverse categories. Um, and the other part of it is there is so many permutation combinations. So if you look at furniture, you can actually design your furniture in, with whatever combinations of fabric, leather, color, styles. 
So really what it translates to, it explodes from millions of products to hundreds of millions of SKUs, which ultimately have to be uh, modeled in such a way that the customer can find, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, without having to really struggle too much. So for that, uh, we the only way we could go was with AI. And, uh, and we are proud to actually say, and our CEO also mentioned this in the earnings call, that um, we have our own proprietary uh, recommendations engine that we built actually to solve that specific problem because we couldn't otherwise scale mm -hmm. to come up with an, um, the right experience for the customers to be able to understand their intent when they're coming into our website or uh, you know using our other channels, trying to understand what kind of customer they are, like their persona, like what are they looking for, and come up with the right kind of recommendations for them. So. Now, your company has a similar challenge with Avery's, and that is, we're talking about customer experience, but you have two different kinds of customers, the ones that are buying online and the ones that are buying in the brick and mortar stores. So Avery, does Gap use automation differently between the two? To an extent, yes. Although I will say that one of the barriers we're trying to break down is the traditional silo between online and stores. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I keep pushing my team on is this concept that exactly what you're talking about, recommendations, personalization, is an online-only capability is really a legacy mentality around how we used to think about these two channels as silos. And the reality is, you know, we can use the exact same personalization algorithms, whether it be a customer going to the store. So if you were to go into an Athleta and walk in, they would offer you a clienteling experience. And that clienteling experience is driven by the same algorithms that would drive an online experience. We know who you are. We have context of what you're looking for based on your previous shopping behaviors. And we're going to surface recommendations. We're going to surface ways that we can engage with you that we think will be net positive to your experience. Um, so yes, they are different. But I would argue that we are trying hard to eliminate those differences mm -hmm. and think of it truly is omnichannel is, you know, at some point, particularly in the pandemic, it became about, you know, curbside pickup, ship from store, BOPIS. But the reality is omnichannel has to be customer focused. And it's about the customer's experience across your channels and trying to create that cohesive experience where whether they're showing up online or stores, they're getting the same version of us, just in a different touch point. And again, the goal is if you have a successful omni-channel, you will always have that customer no matter where they are. I'm going to combine my next question with a question that we have from the audience. And I think, Janice, you're a good one to, to answer this because your company doesn't deal with the T-shirt and the shun knife, but just massive amounts of data, customer data, and then data that you need to use to make good decisions. So this question, with so much data, where do you store it? How do you store it for decision making? And how do the decision makers access the data in order to make those smart decisions for PayPal? Yep. <clears throat> we spend a lot of time to have this whole pipeline and ecosystem built so that the different teams can effectively work together. So we have one team on the data engineering to like uh, process the data, make sure that the data schema is done right. And we have a team to build machine learning models because uh, uh, with the proper data schema and uh, applying the AI algorithm, we can build different models and provide different insights. And then we have the end uh, user, the decision maker, um, we have the same access point. Basically, we have a good handshake in the whole ecosystem and the decision makers can access the result of those AI models to see how to apply into the product experience, how to apply in the customer service. So uh, I guess it's a whole ecosystem design is uh, what we focus on to make it happen, to make sure that different organizations and different teams can work together very well. I want to also ask a question for anyone in the audience that similarly works for a global and international company, and that is you have different regulatory requirement standards in different countries, and you need AI in order to manage that. It's it's impossible for a person to keep track. How critical is that? Yeah, it's a very important topic. We want to make sure that we're following all the regulations requirements uh, out there. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, different teams uh, focusing on what is the right regulations in place for all the different problems. For example, we have credit risk. So we make sure that there's no bias, uh, for example, uh, I think uh, race-based uh, bias, all the different types of bias. So we have all sorts of uh, regulation requirements in place depending on the problems, on what type of data can be used for that problem. Uh, also to do a lot of tests and other things to make sure that we don't have anything um, as, I guess, improper being done in our AI systems. And again, we welcome you to submit questions if you would like. Raj and Avery, you have another shared problem, and that is 
the customer wanting to come into a store and seeing a person, whether it's completely off base, they want the t-shirt from Williams-Sonoma, they want the umbrella from Gap, but in this environment, when every single company across every industry is having a hard time hiring, can you share if you are using AI to again help you know, have that customer feel like they're not being ignored? Yeah, no, definitely that's been uh, a real thing, especially in the last two years, and you know, everyone has been impacted by it. But uh, good to let you know that you know, one of our uh, core foundational capabilities is with uh, image AI, um, having, um, um, I think we acquired a company uh, outward four years ago, and they are a very important group that handles um, 360 degree imagery, uh, AR and VR. And with that level of data, and what we were able to do is we were able, able to actually create um, a, a multi-brand uh, design tool called Room Planner, which we were able to actually deploy with uh, computer vision and AI capabilities and put it in the hands of uh, the designers who are in stores. Yeah. So like most stores, I'm sure some of you have gone, the, the design consultation is free, and it could be just one designer, but they really have the power of all the millions of SKUs that we talked about with the design sense uh, in, their palm, in their hand on a tablet, literally, where uh, the, the room planner is allowing them to not only s recommend products, but also design the room with based on the needs of the customer. And uh, basically, they can apply it. And this is something that's available for the customers also by using AR kit on their phone, that they can basically you know, show it on, on the room that they want to design and basically put together various products. So we do not really need a large workforce. Uh, to be able to give the premium experience for the customers who ever walk into our stores. A designer is one designer with the right kind of tools. Using AI is more than enough. Um, I'm going to ask Avery your next question, although this again applies to both of you. Uh, PayPal is busy all year round, but your two companies do go through seasonal demands, especially Williams-Sonoma when you want that shun Japanese steel uh, tempered knife for the ultimate holiday gift. Avery, also, when you have that season when people are buying for gifts, how do you use automation with AI to scale for those days when there's a lot of demand? And this, again, is an audience question. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is really how we scale our operations to handle the load. Um, you know, whether it's big holidays or COVID, I don't know about your businesses, but ours suddenly shut down all the stores and doubled the size of our e-com business overnight, which very grateful that we were able to scale to that. But one of the things that we have is um, really sophisticated AI in terms of how we source our orders, right? And so one of the things that can happen is your, if your distribution centers become overloaded, you gain a backlog, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start being late to the customer. You're gonna disappoint your customer from a delivery service standpoint. And so we were very grateful we had AI in place that helps us spread the load of our um, networks, excuse me, across our stores. And we really did, especially during COVID, although this applies in more normal periods during the holidays, allow us to really spread the load across all of our nodes in our fleet. So this includes stores, distribution centers, and that intelligence allowed us to scale into that demand without overloading any single node within our supply chain. And again, more normal times during holiday, it's the same thing. You know, if you get to eight, 10 day backlog in your distribution center, well, guess what's gonna happen? People don't get their Christmas gifts on time. Um, and if that happens, you disappoint them and they don't come back. And so for us, AI really allowed us to scale those operations, both again, more normal times and then within COVID in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do if we had used our non-AA based previous logic. So supply chain could be its own panel, and I will come back and ask you more about that. But in the meantime, Janice, I want to ask you a question, because just down the street at Moscone Center is one of the world's largest cybersecurity conferences going on right now. You deal with critical personal data. I am sure you have to use AI to defend your customer, your account holder's information. Tell me how that's done. Um, we invest heavily in this space. So first of all, the information security, we have a um, defense in depth approach. So we have multiple layers of control. And uh, we have also throughout that process, not just technology, we, uh, so technology front, we look at all the open source tools, technology, what's the latest in the market. We are constantly update our, um, our ecosystem. And also we have AI based detection systems. We leverage all the data points we can get, look at like all the 
I guess any spike in traffic looking at normal, uh, all those things that we look at constantly to see anything that is uh, maybe we're under some fraud attack or some like a same some intruder that is uh, trying to get access to our system. So we have all those in place and being constantly updated to make sure that we're adapting to the latest trends. And I'm not sure how many of you are facing this problem, but I heard one of the biggest challenges in cybersecurity is not just dealing with the valid attacks, but ruling out the attacks that are not. That still takes a lot of manpower, a lot of scut work, I've actually heard, and that stresses out the teams that are trying to protect the data. So you want to be very careful with that. Okay, let's dig into, because we're coming to our last five minutes, and so many companies are dealing with the challenges of the supply chain. So Raj, you have a million different products, and you got to make sure that the person gets the couch with the correct arm facing sectional. So how are you using AI to deal with products that are, many of them are being assembled or produced overseas, they have to get to different stores across the country or in Europe, that seems to be a monster challenge. Yeah. And uh, I, I just wanted to also start by saying, um, not to make it uh, you know, bigger than it is, but I was telling you about the products and the SKUs relationship. Um, one other thing to note with uh, most of the products that our brands sell, they are, most of them made to order. I don't know if many of them realize, because it's of those permutation combinations we just talked about. It's just impossible for us to create uh, a couch or a, you know, a table with 150 different combinations and store them in the warehouse, and they're also bulky items. So you can appreciate that some of it, that's one of the reasons why you don't get instant delivery on those products which are custom made. But the flip side to that is these products are not even in a warehouse. So, and then they are probably, most of our vendors are all over the globe. Let's just assume they are on the other side of, of the world. Uh, so essentially what is, what, is, what is happening is we need to, the conventional approaches of predicting delivery times based on where the product is doesn't work for us. So, so what, what we had to do is we actually had to embark on a very elaborate effort to track the source from all the way from the manufacturer to the various points in the supply chain and be able to optimize at every touch point, every node. And then basically, and say, like, here is how your, your, your expected delivery date is going to be. So it's not really an optimization of a date. It's more of an accuracy of the promise. The product may come after a month or month and a half. That's perfectly fine. What the customer is looking for is, okay, you're promising me a particular date. Please make sure you keep it, because especially if you look at the furniture areas, you cannot, I cannot just leave it on the side of, in the front of the door and go, right? We have to really book an appointment. Maybe somebody takes a PTO, stays home, clears all their you know, room just because it's coming. So there's actually much more um, dependency on the customer and they rely on us to be as accurate as possible. And for us, that actually is coming not with a simple decision, but it's really a multi-point decision mapping through the entire supply chain, every touch point, uh, before we tell the customer on the, on the website when they're making the order, your order will uh, uh, arrive in this one week time frame or two week time. But even then it could get stuck on a container ship that is stuck in mud or in the Suez Canal, so that's <laughs> not your fault. Um, Avery, I just came back from a college reunion and someone predicted poorly because they had these vests given out and there was a whole table of triple extra large men's and extra extra small women. And most people with, went without vests except for me that I picked that up. So I can only imagine your challenge getting that shirt in the right size for the people for how many men or women are shopping so again the same thing how are you using ai to just meet the incredible demands with getting products in good times to the right stores to the right customers and also in times like this where we have supply chain challenges every day yeah, I mean, I think especially with the sizing, the fact is with 2,000 stores, an average of eight sizes per garment, tops and bottoms, you're never going to be right all the time. So thing one is just acknowledge you're going to be wrong, no matter how good you try to be. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you know, if any of you are in the, the business of selling salt, then maybe we should talk. But I sell fashion apparel, which is near impossible to forecast. So it really is about using AI within the supply chain to create resiliency. Because it, once you acknowledge you're going to be wrong, then it's about what are your pipelines to fix it and what are your what's the predictive method you're using to understand ahead of time how to repair a damaged supply chain. So whether it's you just got it wrong because you guessed something was going to sell and it's not selling, or, and believe me, 
Uh, Long Beach was not fun for us. I don't know how many of you had containers stuck in Long Beach. It was not good times. Um, but all the way through to your supply chain, when you have things that you expected to come in that were going to complete outfits that didn't come in suddenly, and how do you use your AI demand forecast to start to, as best you can, manage through that and repair things? And I think that's for, you know where we really, our sweet spot is, is acknowledge you're going to be wrong, build responsiveness within your supply chain to fix it when it goes sideways, and then create, use AI to leverage to understand what the right actions to take are. And again, it's imperfect. I'm sure you can still go to one of our stores and find three extra larges and something. But it has made huge improvements from you know, how we used to do it before we had the AI. I just want to say there is a shocking variety in the kinds of salt that's so, so, sold globally. <laughs> and maybe Raj and his Williams Sonoma stores yeah. could confirm that. I want to thank all three of you. I know we weren't able to cover everything, but hopefully you can attract, uh, go, go and uh, talk to our fabulous panelists at the networking reception. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.